going. Okay. Well, thank you, brave souls, for, for, for coming out on this horribly chilly evening um, um, for this. So, uh, my name is Neville Smith. I'm a board member at uh, Red Hook Responds. Um, and uh, Sarah Ugolini is the executive director at uh, the community center in Red Hook. And um, we got together two years ago and started talking about um, doing this project um, to find out where the gaps and needs are in our communities. And those communities are, uh, are the geography that we think about from Red Hook Response point of view is the Rhinebeck and Red Hook school districts. Um, and I think the community center serves a population a little wider than that. But, um, but I guess I'll say we, we consider Rhinebeck and Red Hook our, 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 our bread and butter for this. And that's what the, the, um, this report covers. Um, so we hired um, uh, Hudson uh, Valley Pattern for Progress to do the, um, a, a study of, again, where, where the gaps and needs are in the, in the community. And um, uh, late, this, late June, um, they, they published it. We, it. we put it out there through um, the media. Um, and now we've just started having some presentations about it to kind of get the community to start thinking about, OK, now we know what they are. What's next? And so that's what, I, what you're here for tonight. And so um, I just wanted to thank those and let you know who, who, who made this possible. Um, this was funded by the Dyson Foundation, the Mary Norris Pryor Foundation, the Thomas Thompson Trust, and then the towns and villages of Rhinebeck and Red Hook. Um, so we thank them very much for making this possible. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Adam Bosch, who's the president and CEO of Pattern, um, who's going to take us through this study. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so listen, it's a small group. If you have questions, interrupt me. It's fine. Yeah. I will give you one warning is that this is about as loud as I get. I only have one vocal cord, so I'm going to try my best to project, but if you can't hear, move up. Move up closer just because rooms like this tend to heat up my voice a little bit. Um, so just a little bit about Pattern for Progress. First, for those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, we're a nonprofit regional research and planning organization that was founded back in 1965. Uh, we do work in the nine counties immediately north of New York City, so that's Westchester, Putnam, Rockland, Orange, Dutchess, Sullivan, Ulster, Columbia, Green. Uh, and we do, we work on a whole host of topics. We have a big center dedicated to housing studies and needs assessments and action plans. Uh, we also work on infrastructure, transportation, community revitalization projects, demographic trends, and all sorts of things. Uh, we have a, a staff of six, including professional planners and uh, research specialists. And unfortunately, tonight, uh, the principal planner who worked on this project, Kate Stryker, couldn't be here because it's her daughter's uh, parent-teacher night. So, so you're stuck with me. I apologize. Um, but just want to go through uh, tonight the major findings from the study, and then we can have some sort of some discussion about the what next question, right? We had that discussion when we presented last week in Red Hook, and uh, I may preempt it by just sharing my thoughts when I get to the end of the slides about what I think would be best to happen next now that you have a clear view. Let's start with talking about what is a community needs assessment? Well, community needs assessment combines data and interviews to understand what needs a community feels like are being unmet. The data tell us a lot about trends, <laughs> tell us about service gaps, but really it's the interviews that then help illustrate uh, through people's real lives the things that we think that we see in the data. So that's more or less what we did here. How do we do it? Well, the first thing we did was we reviewed a whole bunch of documents, right? We reviewed comprehensive plans, we reviewed uh, kitchen table conversations, Audubon International Sustainable Programs. We took all of the different planning documents that were around in Red Hook and Rhinebeck, and we read through them because we wanted to understand work that had been done up till now. We then did a lot of quantitative analysis. That's a fancy planner way of saying we looked at data. And we looked at data from the census, from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, from the Office of Real Property Tax Services, community health indicator reports, and other sources just to measure how things are changing over time in these two, or I should say four communities, two communities. Uh, and then we did a lot of qualitative work. That's a way of saying getting out into the community and talking with folks. So we did 24 interviews with local social service providers and community leaders. We led three community meetings that were scheduled at different times and venues. We had a Spanish uh, language interpreter available at one of the meetings so that we could give some input. 
uh, from folks who are Spanish speaking. Uh, we got 313 responses to a survey that we put out there where we solicited feedback from people. The uh, survey was 40 questions long, again, available in both English and in Spanish. Uh, and we, did, we attended community events including community conversations, uh, Red, Hook Central School District, Red Hook Central School District, Red Hook Together Meeting, Northern Duchess Mental Health Collective, and several other things. We then write synthesize that, again, a fancy way of saying look at the data, look at the interviews, and see where we start to see things bubbling to the surface that we heard a whole bunch of times, or we see in the deep data as being a particular stressor for the community. So that's the process that we went through to put this together. Uh, the community needs that were identified, there were 12 key community needs that were identified, and those needs had to meet a few criteria, right? They had to be expressed by a substantial number of people. If one person told us something or two people told us something and we didn't hear it five, six, seven, eight, ten times, you know, it's not that we discounted that person's opinion, but we wanted to hear, we wanted to look for things that we heard over and over so that we knew there was a substantial need among a larger cross-section of people. Um, determined to be significant in terms of its impact on the quality of life for residents in the community. So we want to focus on things that really affect uh, people's quality of life and found to be crucial issues for overall community stability, right? Which is a community's ability to meet its current and future needs related to the environment, resources, food, the economy, housing infrastructure, and social and governmental needs. Um, the needs that we teased out are grouped according to whether they can be addressed locally or whether they need to be acted upon by some you know, higher level of civic structure. So uh, that's the process we went through. And now I'm going to start by going through the needs that we found, that we heard about a lot, and go through some modest recommendations that we put together to help steer the conversation about how you might want to address these needs. The first need we have up is, uh, is food support. I think this is something across the region that we often don't talk about a lot, but it exists. It's surprising when you actually dig. You don't have to dig too deep to find that there are more people who don't have access to food in our region than we might think. And that's certainly the case here. So volunteers from local food banks and other assistance groups have certainly reported an increase in the need since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, when we did the survey, again, about 300 people, uh, access to food was the fourth ranked need, and we had 98 respondents say that access to food was a personal challenge for them, okay? Uh, according to data from the uh, food pantry at the United Methodist Church there in Red Hook, uh, from 2018 until 2023, they saw a 137% increase in the number of seniors coming for food support, a 130% increase in the number of children, and a 75% increase in the number of all adults uh, that went along with a 35% increase in the number of families. So again, you know, that need uh, going up, and I think, um, I can't speak to what the regional numbers are, but certainly in my conversations with other civic leaders across the region know that there are similar upticks in need that they've seen. So related needs to this, right? More cold storage and availability of fresh foods was something we heard. Transportation of food from the food bank to the pantries, right? Getting it from the central hub out to the places where it's ultimately distributed. Uh, food delivery for people who are homebound. We're gonna talk about transportation in a minute, but that's another one I think maybe we undersell in the region is the degree to which a lot more people don't have cars or don't have a way to get around than we might understand and also need to consider how to sustain the work that's being done around food support when most of it is led by volunteers, right? We're always concerned uh, in terms of what happens when some substantial portion of those volunteers go away, right? Want to make sure that those programs that people are relying on uh, don't go away with them, okay? Uh, the other one, uh, another one that was teased out was childcare. Now I'm gonna go on a little bit of a tangent here. Because for Pattern for Progress this year, child care is the biggest independent research project we are doing for the nine county region. So we have really dug deep to understand the child care shortage in the region. And we're studying child care region wide from the standpoint of availability and affordability, right? 
Availability being that we've seen a substantial proportion of the overall child care centers in the region shut down in the past five to 10 years. And affordability in the sense that if, uh, child care is averaging somewhere around $1,100 to $1,400 a month for one child uh, across the entire region. And when you think about that and you pair it with college debt, when you pair with college debt, it's about $2,500 a month for the typical two-earner college-educated family. And that's money they can't save toward things like down payment and closing costs for a home and other things. So it's a real financial stress that's dragging down a lot of our young families at that sort of family formulation stage. Hello, come on in. Now, according to data from the Child Care Council in Duchess and Putnam, there has been a decline in child care facilities before COVID to now. And we'll have more data on that in our study. I can tell you, you go just over to the, to the center that covers Ulster and Green, they've seen a decline of more than 50% in the child care providers in that particular child care council. 23% of uh, respondents, which is 71 people, uh, have children under 18 in their home, and 55 expressed some need for child care that they felt was being unmet, okay? Um, and by the way, don't forget, child care takes a lot of different forms, right? There's daycare, there's just care before and after school, there's care during evening hours for people who have nighttime jobs, uh, there's of course pre-K which is expanding across the state, there's lots of different forms. I do want to point out one thing up here, and this is not, I'll, I'll explain what that box says. One of the things that we're finding as we start to dig into the regional data on child care is that there has been allocated a lot of financial assistance that's going unused. So here in Dutchess County, the state allocated $11.4 million last year to support people in paying for childcare, but only 5.3 million of that was actually used. So, you know, 54% of the money that people were eligible to tap into in Dutchess County didn't go anywhere. It just sat unused, okay? Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. I'm not gonna go on a big tangent, but, but one of the big reasons is communication, okay? The, the eligibility for this is up to 300% of the poverty rate, or, or it's 300% of, uh, of the rate of what you need to qualify for social services. So, to qualify for most social services, you need to make like 30-ish thousand dollars or less, or 35-ish thousand dollars or less. They were advertising this mostly through the social service departments, okay? The problem was you could make up to like seventy-five, eighty, eighty-five thousand dollars and qualify for this money. So by only advertising it through social services, you were potentially only reaching like a third of the audience that actually qualified for the money. Now, the state understands this. The state actually in the budget last year pass some laws to um, change the way that this money is governed, conveyed, you know, di dispersed, and hopefully we'll see this money actually then be put to work. Uh, this is federal money, by the way, and my understanding is it's not being extended either. So while this is a lifeline for now, it's not a forever lifeline. So we still have this child care challenge locally and regionally. Uh, locally focused community needs, again, youth services and opportunities, right? Red Hook Community Center, Culture Connect, public libraries, other providers offer a lot of things for youth to do in the community, but still the youth are, you know, the youth services were articulated as a need. Why? There's likely two, you know, answers to this. In some cases, it may be a mismatch between the offerings of those organizations and what the youth really feel like they need. And in other cases, it's really the advertisement of those programs are not reaching the people who are seeking youth programs. And I said this when we were in Red Hook. One of the themes that's going to run constant through all these community needs is communication. Communication right now is tougher than it ever has been. Why? Because right now, we are in a, we are in a society where our communication is more splintered across multiple platforms, some digital, some not digital. I should say many of them digital, okay? But it used to be, and right, I'm an old dyed-in-the-wool newspaper reporter. I, my background is in journalism. I was a newspaper reporter for 10 years. And it used to be, just as recently as 15, 20 years ago, you could put something like this in the newspaper and probably reach like 90% of the people you were trying to reach. 
That's not the case anymore. Instead of putting it in one place, now you've got to put it in 10 different places just to reach even close to the same size audience. So this is a real challenge that is ubiquitous you know, across the region, probably even across the country, is we have great stuff going on. How the heck do we let people know so they can engage in it, right? And it really takes a lot more burning shoe leather to reach those people nowadays. Uh, specific youth-oriented services and programs that were requested through the surveys included, you know, things related to jobs, right? Internships, mentorship, apprenticeship, we hear that pretty much across the region. LGBTQ support center that's outside the schools. Uh, Community-based activities such as art and music and science, technology, engineering, and math related activities, especially during the winter months when kids can't get outside and we want to give them something productive to do indoors. Life skills programs, learning strategies and therapy support, outdoor activities and experiential learning, uh, activities related to diversity and equity, and home school resources. We still are seeing a lot more people homeschooled now than before the pandemic. Um, senior services opportunities and aging in place. Again, here in your communities, you reflect the region-wide trend, which is that we are getting older as a region. In fact, here in Dutchess County, our births over the past 25 years are down 22%, okay? So we are getting older pretty rapidly, and the younger cohorts are much smaller than the older cohorts in our population. So some of the needs that were identified related to our aging population included programs for active seniors, right? Social connectivity is important. Assistance navigating existing services and resources for the aging. Uh, legal assistance related to access to Medicaid, housing, and end of life planning. Uh, handyman services at a reduced cost by volunteers. I mentioned to Neville, I've got a plumber coming to my house tomorrow and I'm just like, you know, I know it's gonna cost a lot. You know, that's an important service, but when you're on a fixed income, man, that, that can be tough, right? That, so that, that was teased out. Caregiving services, transportation services, which we're gonna hit on some more in a minute. We already talked about food support, financial assistance for seniors on a fixed income, technology assistance, and uh, rental medical equipment for people with disabilities. This technology assistance one is interesting, and again, ubiquitous in a lot of ways. Nowadays, like, you can't apply for a job unless you have good digital dexterity. Or for our seniors, nowadays it's hard to even make a doctor's appointment without having some sort of internet access and techno technological know-how, right? You can see here, right, these are uh, population numbers from 2010 and 2021 of the number of people 65 years or older, and you can see that upward trend. And over time, over the next decade, that trend gets a little even steeper, okay? So uh, we know this is a region-wide trend, and we have to think about the uh, types of services these folks need uh, as they age in our communities. Uh, pedestrian safety, this was not one we necessarily expected to find, but is an interesting one, right? Seniors, children, people with disabilities, and others who can't afford a vehicle, right? They're often depend on walking, biking, and other non-motorized transportation. Uh, and in the community meetings, the interviews, you know, we heard people talk about the dangers of certain intersections and crossings and critical locations, including near the post office in the village of Red Hook. We heard about speeding cars and lacking, uh, you know, what people perceived to be lacking uh, traffic law enforcement. We heard about a lack of sidewalks in some places. We heard about bikeless, bicyclists and pedestrians. Uh, not being safe, especially in the more rural parts of the communities, right? We heard a lot about uh, these sort of things. And, uh, you know, I think, Neville, correct me if I'm wrong, at one point I, I seem to remember Kate telling me there was even a committee at some point that would bring some of these concerns to the police department. People talked about maybe either getting that restarted or at least having a group that could tease out the places that were perceived as most dangerous or that needed some sort of pedestrian friendly upgrade and you'll see that in the, in the recommendations coming up. Um, community cohesion and diversity, right? Community cohesion is when residents from different backgrounds have some common bonds, some common vision of the place where they live, have opportunities to uh, interact with one another in a positive way, and really have a sense of like this place that I live is mine and my neighbors feel the same way and we're Red Hook, we're Rhinebeck, right? Um, and we heard the following concerns related to that. 
you know, people of minority racial and ethnic groups don't always feel as welcome and safe in the community as they'd like, right? That's what they said. The undocumented population is often underrepresented in public discussions and hidden from the mainstream culture. We see that across the entire region. When we do studies down in Westchester County on housing or Rockland County or even out in Sullivan County, the most difficult part for our researchers and planners is specifically getting to the Hispanic community because of some of the fears they have about talking to folks who are studying stuff that we study. They have fears of deportation, fears of other things, and yet that's the only growth sector in the entire region. The only growing group of people in the region is the Hispanic population. And so making sure we get to them and understand their needs is important because their needs increasingly are our needs, okay? Um, the high number of tourists is problematic for the community since local governments and business cater to non-residents. That was an opinion we heard often. Uh, there's not enough public gathering spaces and there's a need for opportunities for cultural diversity and more signs that the community welcomes people of different backgrounds. We'll talk about this in the recommendations section. I mentioned the difficulty with communications. You can see what this one survey respondent said here. Uh, people feel a need, excuse me, for improved communication about what's happening in the community. Again, not easy nowadays, but certainly people have a craving for it. People who need assistance the most are sometimes unaware that resources and opportunities exist within their community. This is true, again, practically everywhere. If people have a need, sometimes or quite often, they have a hard time getting to the place that might have a service to help them meet that need, right? Others in the community might be more active and involved if they knew about events and programs. So this, this is teasing out some desire to volunteer but not being able to find opportunities. Um, and those without internet access may be unable to access news, other important resources. <clears throat> you may be surprised, but almost one out of every 10 residents who live among you still do not have an internet subscription or cell phone uh, or internet access according to the most recent census data, okay? Uh, that's not bad in the sense that there are other more rural parts of the region that are, that are worse than that, you know? Uh, so, you know, those people can feel a little disconnected. <clears throat> transportation. Let me just get a sip of water, folks, sorry. Uh, transportation, again, I think this one is oftentimes surprising for folks. About one, of, well, about one out of every 20 of your neighbors doesn't have a car, right? Uh, so that means they got to get around in other ways. And we did hear from people who expressed a need for more tr public transportation options. <clears throat> we heard a lot about the desire to have more frequent bus transportation. Uh, we did hear about transportation desires one or two times a week to and from Kingston. Uh, we'll get into that. There used to be a bus that came here from Ulster County and delivered people back to Kingston and back and forth, and that was discontinued for various reasons. Uh, free transportation in the grocery store, transportation that's affordable for seniors, and transportation specifically from Tivoli <coughs> to Red Hook and Rhinebeck. And you can see here, um, I think one of the main one of the main reasons that repeated over and over again is understand that you're actually pretty fortunate because you have the Northern Duchess Complex here to have pretty good access to healthcare relative to most of the region. But there are certain services, and mental health was one of them that we heard about most often, that maybe is not well represented among the medical offerings here. And a lot of people have been going just over the other side of the river to get specialty services that they now kind of feel a little stranded from if they don't have a vehicle. Uh, health care, reports of not being able to find a primary care physician, long wait times. Again, long wait times are everywhere, folks. We have a major regional workforce shortage that's going to only get worse over the next few decades. And one of the industry sectors it is hitting the hardest is health care. So I called my doctor the other day to schedule an annual physical. They said they were booking 10 and a half months out. I joked that if they would, I joked that if they told me, you know, it was going to be another 45 days. It would cease to be an annual physical, right? So, you know, but that is a ubiquitous problem across the entire region. We don't have enough nurses, doctors, lab techs, and other people in that 
in that industry. And actually, if you look at the labor data, the interest among young people in working that industry has actually fallen. So just as our needs are going up, the supply of people interested in working in that industry is going down. It's really, really a big problem for the region. High cost of care and prescription drugs, uh, transportation challenges that limit people's access to care and lead to depression since people are homebound and isolated, and also contribute to that poor nutrition uh, issue we talked about since they can't access fresh foods. And then healthcare staffing can be challenging when there's no affordable housing in communities to house the need employees. We're going to talk about housing in a minute. But this is one of the challenges. People think that everyone in healthcare makes a lot of money. That ain't true. Uh, some of these people don't make a lot of money, especially uh, home health aides, CNAs. Some of these people that we really need more of because the need is going up, some of them make under $20 an hour. And I will tell you, you cannot afford anywhere to live in this area on under $20 an hour. It ain't happening. Okay? So, this is a big this is a big challenge. Um, mental health, right? 49, 49 of the survey respondents listed their own mental health issues as a top one of their top five needs. And three of the respondents reported that they're currently not working because of, of mental health issues. Um, particular, particularly interest, particularly interesting trend that we're seeing in schools, and it was teased out through this. There have been a lot of studies, a lot of reports lately on depression and other mental health issues in young people, especially young women, teenage girls. And increasingly, the literature is looking at social media as one of the main culprits for that upswing in those mental health problems. Because generally in our history, we've seen that uptick when divorce rates are high, when teenage pregnancies go up, when drug use rates are high, things like that. All of those things right now, relative to our past, are very low. So doctors, medical researchers, are very interested to understand this huge upswing in depression, anxiety, and other mental health issues. Again, particularly acute among young women and teenage girls. And social media, and use of social media, and seeing other people's lives, and not feeling up to snuff, and things of that nature, is really what they're landing on more and more. And here in the school district, right, they said they, they've seen one or two students a year hospitalized for mental health issues in the past, but now it's occurring on a weekly basis, okay? So this is a societal challenge, and we're just teasing it out here on the local level, right? Attainable housing, right? We just, you know, my organization, we run something called the Center for Housing Solutions. We just had our big annual housing conference yesterday. 160 people showed up. We talked a lot about the data relative to housing in the region, the fact that we are in the middle of this massive crisis related to housing affordability and availability. And we also talked about the fact that this housing crisis is putting historic stress on our workforce, right? As I mentioned, births are down 20 to 35% in every county across the region, okay? 97 of our 120 school districts, including every single school district in, all, in Dutchess County, is shrinking. Uh, and in many cases, by somewhere like in the 10 to 30% range since 2008, okay? We got a couple school districts, one of them shrink by 48% just in the past 20 years, okay? We are seeing that housing increasingly is a big part of the mix in terms of the workforce issues that we're having and other issues that we're having. Rising housing costs, right? Urgent critical concern for every community in the region, including here in Rhinebeck and in Red Oak. Uh, let's be frank. The starter home does not exist in our region anymore, period. There is practically no way for people to graduate from rentals to ownership in the region right now, and there's no debate on it. Okay, that's the reality. Um, so purchasing a home is out of reach. Uh, home prices, as you can see here, have rapidly escalated, right? So town of Rhinebeck, they've gone up 59%. Uh, median price uh, since 2012, 55% in Rhinebeck. Just over the past five years alone, uh, here in Dutchess County, the median price has gone up by a little bit more than 60%. Okay, that's a little better in Sullivan County where they more than doubled in four years, okay? But this is what we're seeing across the entire region. We issued a report just on Wednesday, <clears throat> what's today? No, on Tuesday, 
And what it found is we did this whole in-depth analysis of the mortgage that the median earning family could qualify for county by county by county and compared it to the price of the median house county by county by county. And in every single county, families looking to buy a home fall short of affording it by mortgage access by more than $125,000. That's how deep out of reach we are right now, okay? Uh, and it's really, really top on people. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that more and more and more people are stuck in rentals for longer and in many cases for good, okay? That puts pressure on the rental market, it pushes rents up, especially in an era when we have underproduced housing. Since 2010, we've only produced 0.45 units of housing for every job that we attracted to the region, right? So really an imbalance there. Uh, families uh, that have been in the area for generations also report that they're finding it difficult, difficult, difficult to stay. Uh, there is a special acute need for affordable housing that's close to services, employment opportunities, and public transportation. And it's important to understand that steep housing prices put pressure on household budgets. And this manifests itself in a lot of other ways. Not being able to afford food, not being able to afford car repairs, not being able to afford other essentials that you need. So when we start to see housing prices accumulating, or um, not accumulating, but accounting for say 50, 60, 70% of people's take home pay, which is happening more and more across the region, that means they have less money left over to pay for those other, not only the things that they would like to do, but certainly the things that they absolutely need, like food, clothing, and other stuff. So we're seeing this across the region. You can see here also on the bottom what's happening with those, with those median rents. Um, interesting to note, uh, I will point you toward our out of reach report again that came out this week, is that rents, rents are far outpacing income. And uh, if you look at the, what we would call the renter class, which is like the bottom 40th percentile of all earners in Dutchess County, their earnings relative to inflation have gone down over the past decade. So their purchasing power has gone down. And that's adding to the stress of high prices, lower earning power, really, really creates the stress that a lot of people are feeling. Okay, now. What the heck are we going to do about all this stuff, right? So these are just some recommendations that sort of follow along uh, with the challenges that we teased out uh, that that we want folks to at least think about, right? So can I? Yes. I do want. I don't know from the last. No, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. When you were back at the um, youth, yes, and um, mental needs, um, mental issues that people are having, okay, and stuff like that. You were saying that it's mostly that the biggest issue right now are girls. That's what, the, that's, that's what the medical literature showed, yep. But I have to say that um, that always, I mean, I definitely believe in sure. women and needing certain things, but boys have been forgotten and yeah. they often show up in different ways. Yeah. So um, the schools never had heard when I went, when my son went there not too long ago, um, of uh, attention deficit disorder, mm -hmm. organizational difficulties, and um, and then I had teachers saying, oh, no, your son doesn't have that. My daughter has that. It shows totally differently. Yeah, well, yeah, sure. Yeah, it does. And so boys, they, they come in with a totally different set of things. And when I talk to the schools, they said, um, yeah, the, the, we, the teachers have never heard of this. Yeah. And they said that we don't get funding for it. Now, I think I've heard that maybe they're trying to do some things now, but they've got a lot of catching up to do. So I don't want to forget yeah. about the boys. Oh, absolutely. Who and ends up dropping out of school? Right. It seems to me that it's mostly boys. Yeah, absolutely. And, and well, I was just regurgitating some national literature that I had read about sort of the causes and who was affecting most. But when you have your local school district saying that now it's a weekly thing, you know, that's everybody, right? I mean, that's, yeah. that, that's across the board. It's not girls alone, and I, I framed, if I framed it that way, I apologize. But, but yeah, that's affecting everybody. 
Um, and again, they're, they're pointing to, and I see it in my own 10 year old, you know, some of the ways screen time affects him. You know, I, I, I can only imagine when he's 13, 14, and that screen time now is taking on a different meaning aspirationally, interactively, right? And just thinking about how that's going to affect him, uh, which is why uh, <laughs> we've had to buckle down at home. This isn't about me. Um, so just going back to first recommendations, set of recommendations are related to just growing that operation, operational capacity for the local uh, food security programs. So, you know, a couple things here. One of our recommendations is to meet as, meet as a network, right? You have a lot of people doing a lot of things. You want to make sure that you're sharing them, that you're coordinating them, uh, that you're also talking about gaps that exist so that one group that's doing something great isn't accidentally replicating something else that someone's already doing. When you have limited capacity, limited capital, and needs, you want to make sure that you're using your volunteer power and your money and using the food that you have to give out to people in a way that's well coordinated. Uh, continuing the Red Hook response, local food exchange, right? The exchange has increased uh, the coordination and capacity, reduced food waste, supported farm and pantry models. So you want to include those things that are, you want to continue those things that are going well. Uh, collect and share data to understand needs and trends within communities. So. Right, we have this data point for the Methodist Church. You always want to be collecting data on those needs. Why? A big reason is if you collect the data, you can be more competitive for grants that can help to support these, and you can actually then make sure you're meeting the needs over time as those needs grow, or hopefully as they shrink. If we, you know, if we uh, get a hold of this challenge, identify organizational vulnerabilities. You know, we've always got to be asking: Do we have enough volunteers? Right. Are there unmet needs in the community that organizations can address? What other vulnerabilities does the organization have now? You know, where can we find additional volunteers if we don't have enough? How can we make sure we're engaging with them to keep the ones that we have, right? Uh, create a volunteer opportunity list for the entire food support network and actively recruit volunteers. Identify pantries that would benefit from an increase in cold storage, right? We want to get, right, quite often food pantries are distributing non-perishable stuff. Or you'd like to be able to get, uh, you know, fresh foods out as well. That's going to require cold storage. Uh, develop a system of trans uh, to transport foods to homebound residents. This is kind of the food problem and the transportation and the aging problem. It's the confluence of all those things, right? Uh, promote local production of fresh, fresh food, right? Still have a lot of working farms here in the two towns. And it's a strength that should be leveraged to make sure that people have access to fresh, healthy food. Um, sometimes you can even find grant funding that will support some local farm production specifically for that need. Uh, moving on to increased child care options. Um, we are going to have a whole set of recommendations coming out of our big regional study at the end of the year. So I would encourage you all to, to pay attention to that. But in the interim, you know, convening child care providers in the area to understand the challenges and needs, right? Why are they closing? Why aren't they staying open? Uh, I'll just share one of the things we're seeing across the region is that pre-K, right? Pre-K has been a death blow to a lot of the child care centers because they really relied on four-year-olds in the child care centers for a significant portion of their revenue. Anyone had a kid in child care recently? Oh, man, I'm the only one. Okay. So it's all about ratios, right? It's when they're under 18 months, it's two kids per caregiver in the child care center. Once they hit three, four, now it's 10 kids to every caregiver in the child care center, right? So if you lose the four-year-olds to the school district in universal pre-K, you've just lost the children who provided you your greatest cost, cost to revenue margin, and, you're, and your, your economic model collapses on itself. That's one of the things that's exacerbating the closures of child care centers across the region. So talking to providers about some of those stresses, talking to the school districts about how they might be able to help. By the way, that's an unintended consequence. I think everyone understands universal pre-K is awesome, right? It's great to get kids started on an early education path, but sometimes you don't foresee what one, the, the, the bad ramifications of a good action, right? And so that, that's what universal pre-K fits in the category of. Create a centralized website that lists all the existing child care services. So 
Uh, the County Child Care Council really has that, just making sure people know where to find it. Uh, work with the school districts and county departments to, to, to distribute that information on the support dollars, on the services, all that sort of stuff. Identify some space right around the community that could be used as child care services. My, my piece of advice on this is the Office of Children and Family Services is very strict about what spaces can and cannot be used for child care services, but they're also very willing to tell you. So reach out to them and understand which spaces may qualify and not qualify. And then the last one is working with folks uh, around this county on training uh, to recruit you know, new child care workers, new child care owners. I'm gonna call out in particular the Day One Learning Center in Poughkeepsie, which is run by some really wonderful people. They are training new child care professionals at that nonprofit center in Poughkeepsie. Fortunately, some of those people have not just gone on to work in child care, but they've gone on to open their own centers because they're really dedicated to early childhood education. If you can show them that there is a measurable need here in Red Hook and Rhinebeck, they may come, come up here and open a spot here if they see that there's a need that they can fill and make a good business out of it and do some social good at the same time. So reaching out to Jerry Leiborn and the folks at day one is a great idea. Uh, expanding the school internship opportunities, right? Both school districts really should work with employers in the area to develop a robust school internship program. Uh, they should certainly consider offering course credit for participation in a program like that. Uh, the students should be matched with opportunities based on their interests and talents. Right now, more than 50% of the open jobs in the region don't require a college degree. So we need young people, even those who don't want to go to college, to start thinking about the different places where their talents and their interests intersect, right? There's a body of jobs at that intersection of your talents and your interests. And doing something like this helps them think about that. Um, some interns will, want to, will decide that they want to stay, and, and there should be a pathway for them to do so. And when we talk to New Vance Health, right, the folks who run Northern Dutchess Hospital, uh, they mentioned us that they regionally, recently lost a region, recently launched a regional career navigator and workforce de development program, and the director said that they are eager to work with the school districts to take on to take on students to explore healthcare careers through that program. So, there's certainly opportunities right here in the neighborhood. Uh, prepare for a growing senior population, right? So. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do here, right? Encourage the development of affordable senior housing options, right? That are located within walking distance to the village centers. Um, the development of those, the development process for those projects should be streamlined, should be shortened to the extent that it can be. Uh, and if there are parcels of publicly owned land, we've worked with the city of Hudson, the city of Middletown, all of Ulster County to figure out ways that they can use a very specific, what's called an RFEI process, request, request for expressions of interest, where you can actually use certain public lands for the development of housing that's needed by your citizens and really make sure you get the type and design of housing that you want when you have control over that land and what happens on it. Um, support programs and services for seniors through municipal funding and grants, right? Uh, important support public transportation options, right? We really want to make sure that our seniors and that everyone can get to medical appointments, whether they're here or in Kingston or in Lake Katrine or down in Poughkeepsie. Uh, make volunteer opportunities known and available for seniors who are interested. Great things, a lot of senior citizens really, you know, once they retire, they don't want to sit around. They'd like to volunteer and give back to the community that they either grew up in or lived in for a long time. And uh, making sure that those opportunities are easy to find is a great idea. And prioritize pedestrian safety, which is our, our next item. Really, the municipality should consider uh, some sort of cross-municipal pedestrian safety study, or at the very least, a group of people who can regularly interact with elected officials and police uh, to identify areas of concern throughout the communities, key places where interventions needed, strategies to improve safety to increase resident mobility, and uh, key connections between important destinations. Having that committee is a good idea, right? Formal group uh, can oversee the study, can write, help write grants, receive community input about safety issues, share them with the highway department, share them with planning department, share them with public safety officers. Where there are issues, people want to hear about them, people want to help. Sometimes it might be as simple as repainting a crosswalk that used to be there, 
or if anyone's been anyone been in New Paltz lately? I mean, it's been there for a while, but if you're driving down Main Street in New Paltz right before, right before you hit the bridge that takes you over the Wallkill River, many years ago they installed a little bucket on either side of the street that has flags in it. So when you're crossing the street, you pick up a flag and it just increases your visibility, right? Simple, low cost, but very effective at making sure that as people come down that hill where Gilded Otter used to be, that they're not running right into people who are going there, which is the, where the rail trail crosses the street, right? Uh, municipalities should work with law enforcement officers on, on some strategies for pedestrian safety. And as I said, there's some real good low cost improvements wall painted crosswalks, flashing lights at key intersections, and uh, even teeny tiny flags like I just recommend. Uh, create enhanced public community space. So when we talk about creating or enhancing public space, um, really what we're talking about is making sure that we have places for the community to get together and do stuff. And I say stuff because it could be a whole wide range of things, right? Uh, so. Public space really provides an opportunity for people to interact with other people in the community who they might not otherwise know. Uh, and those interactions really help create those social bonds and that <laughs> sense of place that people said they were craving more of. When you're designing a public space, you gotta make sure it's accessible to residents of different groups and abilities, that it's safe, that it's inclusive of where people can linger, so it has benches, it has tables, it has things where people can hang out, so to speak that it's aesthetically inviting, right? Make sure it has trees that provide cooling benefits. Uh, I'm on a governor's council where we score different projects. And I found it really interesting in the last round of submittals, there were three parks projects, all of which focused on planting trees because the parks didn't have them. And people are like boiling at the park and they don't even go anymore, right? So trees are, trees are important. Uh, also important to consider, what's the programming gonna be, right? I live just over the bridge here in Saugerties. We have a really great park complex there. And periodically throughout the year, we have a Caribbean festival. I'm sure some people have been to the Garlic Festival. We have things that are like more community driven, like a food truck day, a Saugerties food truck day. But it brings a lot of people out from the community. It gives us a chance to mingle. And it's a, it's a real good, uh, I think it's a good model. Um, improving community, com community communication. Ooh, talk about a tongue twister. Um, so I talked about the difficulty in communication, but there are some ideas you can use to amplify messaging and ensure that residents are informed about local events, programs, volunteer opportunities, all sorts of things. You can do a monthly newsletter that's sent in the mail to all residents and sent out through an email blast that lists ongoing and upcoming events, programs, services, volunteer opportunities, all sorts of stuff, right? You can also post it on physical bulletin boards, such as the ones that are out here by the front door. Uh, you want to make sure some are centrally located in the villages, uh, in the towns. Good example of this is Kingston Happenings. I don't know if anyone here has subscribed to Kingston Happenings. City of Kingston, with some help from community volunteers, put this together. It goes out regularly. It's an online central repository for all sorts of things to do in Kingston. And there's a lot to do in Kingston. It goes out all the time. And man, do they see high attendance at the stuff they do. And I think a lot of that has to do uh, with um, this site that was launch launched and the associated email blast that goes out to people who go up, uh, go online and subscribe to it. Uh, it's run now by Brickyard Ventures. Uh, they, they manage the website. Um, enhancing rural transportation options, right? So a couple things. It would be good just to have a sit down with Ulster County and understand why that bus that used to come over from Ulster County and bring people back and forth stopped. Uh, you may have read in the newspaper right now, Ulster County did an interesting experiment where they eliminated the fee for their public buses over the past year and they saw ridership like shoot through the roof, right? They did that and then they realized, wow, this is pretty expensive to run. <laughs> so they're trying to figure out like, can we keep doing this or not? But they're really, really thinking a lot right now about their public transportation system. And it might be a good time just to go there and say, hey, we really valued this bus. Is there any way it could bring it back? What would it take? How can we help? All that sort of stuff. And then there is a model up in Millerton. Uh, they created a locally run dial-a-ride service. Uh, there was some federal transportation dollars in there. 
but that's less about running a specific route, right? A specific loop route, loop route, than it is about having a service where seniors or other people can call up and say, "Hey, today at 10 o'clock, I need a ride to the doctor's office in Brian Neck or Kingston or wherever," and they'll come and pick you up. And uh, this is this would take some legwork, frankly, because you got to figure out: Can you get the same federal funding? Can the federal funding be expanded to just expand this Millerton service to, you know, encompass a larger area? You'd have to do some thinking and some light work on this, but Millerton showing that it's uh, that it's possible, and so it's, it's worth a look. Uh, creating intergenerational, multicultural community building activities. Uh, really, we should think about developing or promoting events that have some cross-cultural, intergenerational appeal, okay? Um, in designing those, it's really important to consider a few things. What type of program is going to attract people of different ages and different groups from different backgrounds, okay? Uh, not everything appeals to everybody, but there are some things that appeal to a very broad base of folks. What type of space do you need? Can it be done at the community center? Does it have to be done outside of the park? Does it require some infrastructure, so to speak. What can be done in the program or the event to encourage the exchange, uh, the exchange between people of different ages and groups? And what time of day of the week is best to maximize participation for people of different ages and groups? So again, with the recreation department, with the community center, with other groups, it's really a calendaring exercise and a, and a, and a thinking about what sort of events you'd like to have. And I know in my community, they tend to sit down at a certain time of year and go, okay, what are we doing for the next six months? Or what are we doing for the next eight months? And so doing that and thinking about how those events can have broad appeal, again, the idea being that everyone feels like there's a piece of Red Hook and Rhinebeck that reflects them, right? And an event's a good way to do that. Okay, I'm out of stuff. Look at that. Uh, I am easy to find. Send me any questions you have. You can ask them here. I will say one thing, uh, because Kate, the principal planner who worked on this, is not here, there's a chance you may ask a question that I don't know the answer to. Uh, I spent a lot of time with Kate going over the report, but certainly she has total recall and knowledge of it better than I do. And so if you do have a question that I, don't know, that I don't know the answer to, here's the good news. I won't pretend that I have the answer. I will tell you I don't know, but I will have Kate uh, get back to you with an answer to your question. So don't be bad. Fire away. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I have two questions. One is just, I just want to get a little clarity on the things I've done. <clears throat> I found it to be really interesting. What you were saying about um, the development of pre-K programs impacting local child care centers. Yep. And I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. Sure. You're saying that if, when pre-K programs are taken on by the school district, it basically hamstrings existing child care centers because the, the age limit is too limited, basically. Uh, this will be in our study when it comes out in December, but Cornell Cooperative, no, not Cornell Cooperative Center, excuse me, Cornell University Center for Applied Demographics, <clears throat> led by a guy named uh, John Sippel did a fabulous study on the effects of pre-K, universal pre-K across the state. And one of the main findings was that in communities that expanded universal pre-K within the school district, within the public school district, because some of that state money was contemplated to be programmed out to child care centers to have a certified UPK teacher in the child care centers, and I don't have data on this, but what they found is that a lot of the school districts applied for waivers to keep all of the money instead and do it in-house, okay? Mm -hmm. And what that does is if you think about the child care center's business model, their business model from a revenue standpoint relies heavily on four-year-olds. Yeah. Because the ratios of staff to four-year-olds is lower. Yes, the ratio is lower, not higher. So, yeah. so when you take that, you're essentially taking their most profitable kids out and sticking them somewhere else, which means that this economic model they rely on to stay open collapses on itself. And then they can't afford to stay open. Put on, pile on top of that, the fact that there are, that we are, 
I know the number for sure, that 25, that now we are high, we had 700 fewer children in 2019 than we did in 1999 in Dutchess County, mm -hmm. okay? Pile on top of the fact that the, the, the sort of the market share, right? The number of kids that need childcare is going down and down and down, and then you took this whole segment out. It's like next to impossible to run a business with those two factors, right? So what we see then is we see shrinkage in the total number of child care centers, which means you have to drive farther to get to one, and you probably have to pay more. That's what, in a nutshell, what we're seeing across the entire region. I'm speaking regionally, not specifically about Red Hook and Rhinebeck. Okay. Isn't pre-K in the public schools free? Yeah. So tricky the question. So I mean, it's wrapped in your tax bill, yes. right? But, but but everybody pays but, the tax. Right. That's right. It's whereas the right. daycare you're paying. That's right. So therefore, the daycare is losing money if you, yep. if your child is that's going right. to the. Yep. Exactly. Um, I just had another question. Yep. Sure. Maybe. No, it's okay. I'm just wondering about the, the 12 key community needs that were identified. Um, nothing came up in regards to climate or concerns about how climate might affect viability, life, lifestyle, community. Sure. Uh, I don't have a great answer to that other than I can tell you other work that we've done, which is that one of the interesting signals we're seeing in the region is, uh, let's talk about migration. What is migration? Sure. Mi migration is the movement of people county by county, by state by state, across the country, within the country. That's migration, okay? And one of the things that we're seeing is we at the Hudson Valley has lost people to migration for 24 out of the past 25 years, and the total is something like, over that time, we've lost a total of 134,033, I think is the exact mm -hmm. number, net people to migration over the past 25 years. One of the only signals that we see of people moving into the region is sort of people from the West Coast, specifically mm -hmm. California, moving to the Hudson Valley. Now, we made an assumption that that was largely because of the uh, growing size of the TV and film industry in our region, which is really growing rapidly. Uh, there are like five new studios in Orange County that are booked for the next two years. There's Lionsgate down in Yonkers, which is filming stuff left and right. I mean, it's really a growth industry. We made that assumption until we met four of those people in just three months' time, and not a single one of them worked in TV and film. They all said they moved here because they were tired of water shortages and their neighbor's house is catching on fire. And that's a climate refugee, whether we like the term or not, that's what that is, right? So one of my planners, Kate, who happened to be the lead, worker, lead, lead person on this project, went to a, a seminar recently out in Jamestown, which is a little, uh, little, no, I'm sorry, Johnson City, which is a little city right next to Binghamton where a bunch of planners got together to talk about should, like we're technically in the Rust Belt, I didn't know that, but technically we are, should Rust Belt communities prepare to take on more people because there's a little bit of a signal of a move back eastward from places that are more arid, struggling with water problems in the west. And we are what, by comparison, water rich, a little more temperate, Right, so in some ways, we're actually better positioned in climate change, and that's not to say it's a problem. There's all sorts of problems related to climate change, right? We have infrastructure that's undersized and can't handle probable, ma probable maximum flows, right? We have a major uh, algae problem in some of our fresh waters that is exacerbated by warm air temperatures that cause warmer surface water temperatures. I used to work in this field, by the way, so, I, so if I sound a little geeky, that's why. Um, so the climate change issues are, you know, significant. They're things that we have to wrestle with. But for this particular thing, it was not sort of like top of mind as a community needs thing that came to people's minds when they were thinking of it in the context of like local stuff they need as a daily item. That doesn't mean it's not important. It just means it wasn't teased out in this particular survey right. with this particular population. Yes? I moved up here from Manhattan 15 months ago. 15 months ago? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it is nice. Where did you live in Manhattan? From, I moved from the 12th floor of an apartment building on the Upper West Side. Oh, on the Upper West Side, to okay. To a rented condominium by a pond behind the hospital. Okay, cool. And so instead of cockroaches and pigeons, I have a heron and a muskrat. So. 
I just love it. It's all great. And it's terrific. green, very green. Now, watching your, uh, your program, I worked at a not-for-profit organization for 25 years in Manhattan. It was yeah. created out of our response to the AIDS crisis. Yeah. Um, I learned a lot and developed a lot of skills during that time. Earning money was not one of them. <laughs> Welcome to the world of nonprofit. However, what I did notice is that if you have a specific project and you know exactly how much it's going to cost, you can find some really guilty rich person <laughs> who would be happy as can be to fund that particular thing because they know the beginning, the middle, and the end of it. Yeah. Okay, it's a very neat package. And while, while the thing that I most respond to, I mean, so many things that you talked about, I mean, I could just. We are the people. Wait, so yeah, let me just on. say one, two things, and that, that's a, about food and food insecurity and the fact that people don't have enough food. It's just staggering in a country like this to no. throw so much food away every day and the people are not eating. Yep. Uh, I read online within the last couple of years about a, a solar greenhouse in, mm -hmm. I think, Nebraska. I mm -hmm. think it might have been called Greenhouse in the Snow or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was solar and geothermal, mm -hmm. year-round, vegetables and fruits and tropical things that you could never imagine in a million years growing in that climate. Out there in a field, cost something like $7,000 to build, I mean, oh, 3000 I mean, it was really cheap to build it. And in it, because of its being solar, it was sustainable. Feeding all kinds of people. Yeah. And then, uh, then recently I read about some prisons closing. I thought, what could you, what could you, how could you repurpose a prison? One way you could repurpose it is you could, you could make it a, um, a hydroponic greenhouse. You must have been spying on one of my meetings today because we were talking about the same idea for malls. Of right, course. we got all these dead malls yes, across the region. Absolutely. We're like, you know, you could grow a lot of food in that mall. One of my staff members said that. I said, that's not a bad idea. Yeah. Um, and all, it, all of the barns you. around that, yeah. that are just kind of sitting there looking yeah. cute. I mean, you know, you can turn them into hydroponic things. Yeah, yeah. And it's it and it's a hands-on thing, and it's multi-generational, and everybody yeah. can get involved. But it's it, we don't have to reinvent the wheel here yeah, to yeah. do this. You know, we yeah. just have to have a specific, pro, a well engineered plan yeah. and get a Mike Bloomberg or a George Soros or I mean Jeff Bezos. Or, I mean, there is so much money in yeah, so many yeah. hands. You know. May I ask you your name? Cynthia. Of All right, Cynthia. Uh, you hit on something that was asked at the last meeting that I promised I was going to talk about, and I didn't, but you reminded me. Which is what you said was like, hey, there's so much stuff here, right? There's so much stuff here. That's right. So inevitably, the first question for the community, right, you, Red Hook, is what the heck do we do? And what we said at the last meeting was, you can't tackle all this stuff simultaneously. A, it'll drive you nuts. B, you won't get anything done, right? So the suggestion I made at the last meeting was, I think the number two is probably right, but if you have real passionate people, you can maybe do three. Pick two things to start with and like really go and tackle them head on in year one and make some tactics and assign them to people with deadlines. You want to, you know, one of the easiest ones, I think, and again, it might not yield fruit, but it's an easy one. Just go over the plank and talk with Ulster County about the bus thing. And like, that's a simple, like, low hanging Just find something that's now. working and replicate it. Yeah. Yep. That, that's another really That's good another good idea. I agree with you 100%. Find something yeah. that's, yeah. The great thing is we don't have to come up with new ideas all the time, but somewhere, someone somewhere else has come up with something cool to solve one of these things and we can replicate it on scale. Across, right? But you got to pick like two or three. And there's, and also, can, there's also a lot of agencies and, and groups doing this right. work yep. in the area already. Yes, yeah, so you don't want to replicate it. They're not. Yep. They, you know, this is information that will help us grow. Yeah. And there are Sorry. other populations that you can tap into, I would think. You probably have already done this in that faith community. Yeah, sure. Because I mean yep. they all they want to bring the, 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 the they want to bring the faithful back. Well here's some here's what you can do. Here's some things you can do. And you can drop flyers all over Ryan Rhinebeck that say snooze you lose, um, you know, uh, Complain and you're not going to get anywhere. Or you know, everybody everybody can tell you what's wrong with anything, but no one wants to do anything to make it be different. No. And I, in my life, I see that things get worse all by themselves. 
and things get better only with effort. Yes. And, and it's not... I In mean, science, they call that the law of entropy. And, yes, yeah. and, and using a, a model that a friend of mine started in Manhattan called Share the Care, you can divide out a plan and get people to choose what they are interested in in this plan and have a couple of changing heads of the committee for you know one month at a time or two weeks at a time so that everybody doesn't always have to do all the work. And everybody gets to do the part of this plan that they're interested in. Well, Neville, sorry, I mean, it sounds like you guys have a volunteer. This is great. <laughs> you, you've, you've, you've solved many of the problems you know, organizationally. I mean, I, it, 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 there's Neville's so let me catch her. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there's so much to be done, and you know, I, I'm getting really old here, folks. I, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to crank this up. But God, you know, as a friend of mine said, I'd rather burn out than rust out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Anyway, I'm going to remember that one. I like that one. Good. So we we talk about affordable housing. Yeah. We talk about senior housing. Yep. We talk about one to to keep and to revitalize the village and to make the village a place that's for everybody. We talk about all these things, but there's an elephant here. What's that? And it's not anything that I mean to be negative. Yeah. But all the houses are being sold and for super expensive. So mm -hmm. nobody, so we have to go out of town yeah. to build new houses yeah. that can be affordable. So yep. we're taking the senior citizens out of the village yep. and sending them out saying, well, we'll provide you a bus. That, that you know, it, there ha I mean, this has been going on for eons and eons. So what are, there's got to be communities that are dealing with this. And yes. successful programs. I agree with everything you just said, okay? Uh, the housing challenge is the most complex, multifaceted challenge that we have in the region. It also happens to be the most important one, in my opinion. I mean, in a lot of people's opinions, right? And, um, you know, some of it comes down to zoning, right? Historically, much of our region was zoned for single family homes on relatively large lots. And guess what? That's not what the need is now, right? Um, even up from an ownership standpoint, the standalone single family house, I mean, some people still can afford that and want to buy that, um, but we haven't built those smaller, like they used to be those Sears kit homes. But we're not building those smaller homes anymore. We're not building, I grew up, uh, you know, I grew up relatively poor. I grew up in an owner-occupied three-family house. I dare you to find one of those that's been built in the past 30 years, right? Doesn't exist. So. We, have, um, we are suffering right now from underlying codes and regulations that don't allow or entice what we need, right? And we're suffering from market forces that are pushing prices beyond our reach. And we're suffering from a certain lack of incentives and ideas, and also this idea that the market's gonna come around and save us. Uh, if the market, if, if housing really truly responded to market forces the way most of pieces of the economy do, you'd be seeing building everywhere right now because the demand for housing has so outpaced the supply, it's unbelievable, right? So I'm not here to prescribe any specific set of solutions to you. Um, you know, Dutchess County had a, had a fairly good housing plan done by a group called CZB. There were a lot of great ideas in there that have to be implemented by communities. But understand this, housing is a regional crisis that largely depends on action on local control. And until we understand that, and, and until we understand you know, my dad worked at ShopRite for 48 years. My mom was a medical records clerk, right? And we all want our grocery store shelf stocked. And we all, when we call up the doctor's office, want our records transferred to a specialist today. Thank you very much. And yet, we don't want to always support the policies that entice or encourage the development of housing that those people need to live in our community so that those goods and services don't slowly disappear from us, right? 
So part of this is understanding our interconnectivity with each other and that the goods and services that we both need and really want rely on people to provide them to us. And if we don't have the housing for those people to live in the communities who provide those goods and services, then we just sort of hollow out over time and become just a playground for like the land of gentry, right? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of sort of what's happening in the past decade. Now, all's not lost, we can, right? There's a lot of people working to try to make sure that the right kind of housing, and by the way, this is across the whole spectrum. This is apartments for very, very low income people. It's middle income housing. It's, you know, housing across the whole spectrum is what we need right now. But we gotta get going, because I'll tell you, the demographic trends for our region are not good, right? They're really not good. This workforce stress that we're feeling across the free industry sector, the data show that it gets worse and worse over the next 20 years. And I'm not here to be the doom and gloom guy, but what happens is if you just walk around like this, you're gonna fall off a cliff someday. I mean, you really gotta be, be mindful about the trends that are happening in the region and the set of solutions you have in your hands to make some impact on. So that's my, my general sort of spiel about housing. But on a local level, zoning is a huge tool. There are certain incentives that you can apply for. There's even certain incentives that are in people's hands that they don't even know they have. Like 485A was called an anti-blight program back in the day. There's something called 485A, which is a local adoption tax incentive. And what it says is if you have a vacant building in your downtown and you have 485A, Someone can come along and refurbish that first floor storefront, and if they add housing to the upper floors, they get like a 12-year tax break on the, on the cost of the total improvements to the building that really makes it financially feasible to do something like that. You have that within your power at the local level to adopt that credit so that you can entice people to do that sort of stuff. So what owner would take that versus a couple million dollars. Yeah, but there's bound to be one. Yeah, but you'd be, you'd, you'd be shocked. So, so you go to places like, again, I'll use the city of Middletown as an example. There have been a lot of people in the city of Middletown in their business improvement district who, listen, when I worked when I worked at the Times Herald Record and our main newsroom was in the middle of the city of Middletown, um, you know, it wasn't doing good, right? You go there now, and it's like, it's, uh, how, can I, how can I be modest about this? It's not that it's a model city, but it's a thriving downtown with very diverse businesses, people living in the downtown, great parks, great pocket parks, things to do, two breweries that keep people coming. They got charging stations in their downtown parking lot that draw people off the highway. They put a lot of thought and effort into it, and there have been people who've come along and said, this building's great for something I want to do, and I'm going to add some housing over time. So there's all this stuff you can do but you know what, the other thing I find, I'm sorry to go rambling on, but the other thing I find is, man, it's really tough for, for, for local, you know, we expect local officials to have, you know, all the time to contemplate these things, but most of our local officials are part-time people who have really important jobs that they do during the day. And this takes focus, attention, expertise, and they, you know, it's tough to do at the local level in a lot of our medium and small sized towns. This is real, like, deep planning strategy stuff. So I don't envy local officials for the workload that they have in their daily lives and in their volunteer lawmaker lives. It's really tough stuff. So it does take a group of uh, well-meaning people to sit down and contemplate what are the best strategies we can apply to try to get closer and closer and closer to some end goal that we have. And right now, housing is probably the most important end goal that we have in the region because of the, the depth and contours of the crisis that we're in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a comment and a question. Sure. A comment. Um, the whole housing crisis here with the upper end. And yeah. You're, you're basically getting two classes of people: people who already own houses, who yeah, can now afford to continue to own houses. That's right. And people who didn't, who will never be able to afford one. Or That's right. Not, not never, but um, that, and clearly, gap, that gap, that gap is, yeah. is getting bigger. And yeah. Clearly, the pandemic increased that because we had a lot of New Yorkers come up and. Correct. Right. Uh, and buy houses, and also I think that cli what you call climate migrants yeah. is that too, because it's not the poor people from California moving here. No, no, it's no. the wealthy Californians who are moving here and, and buying up and, and pushing up the prices. And I don't know if there's anything to do about that, but that's definitely creating a um, almost you know two classes of society here. That's yeah, like a dichotomy. No, that's yeah. 
It's, it's true, and we spent a lot of time at our housing conference yesterday contemplating, you know, what are, what are some of the things we can do, and, and have different habitats for humanity have taken on different models to try to create different types of housing and ownership models, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting and very effective ideas out there. People are creating community land trusts so that the land remains in public ownership, but housing can be built on it to sustain long-term affordability of housing. That's a very interesting, effective model that's being used in Albany and is being used a little bit better in Massachusetts and Vermont, but there's, there's a number of those land trusts. The first one ever was in Georgia. Um, you know, there's a lot of different models, but again, it's... Do you, my, my question yeah, sure. are you familiar with, anybody familiar with the development down in Poughkeepsie, I think it's called Eastgate or East... East Dale, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, is that, what, is that uh, middle class housing, lower class, upper class? You know, I don't want to, I don't want to misspeak. <laughs> Neville or something upper? might know. I think those are fairly market rate, most of them, yeah? It, it, yeah. it is, it, I won't say it's like traditions up in Red Hook. I think it's, it's a little bit more affordable than that, but it's still, it, it, it is upper upper middle class at, at best. Now, I mean, it seems like that's a great <laughs> model. I mean, if they could do that and, well, and mix the, the affordability. Right. Um, now, let, let me, I'm going to ask you a leading question now, though. What would require them to mix the affordability? Local, local that's government. the local control, right? So there's something called, um, Oh my God, how am I going to forget this uh, term? Someone help me out here. It's, uh, no, 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 it's um, uh, incentive, it's incentive zoning, it's tiered incentive zoning. Essentially what you, what, you, what you can do is set up in your local codes to say, hey, anyone who's building more than X number of housing units, and you try to set that pretty high, like 20, 40, you know, whatever your number is, uh, you have to include a certain percentage of those units that are affordable for 80, people 60, at a certain 20, level. Well, well, yeah, you, well you, then you got to be careful, right? Because eight, because so, so, mm -hmm. Doug, the ad, the, the worker making average renter wages in Dutchess County makes about 50 percent of AMI. Okay, so an AMI is area median income. Okay, so that's the 50th percentile of income. So we've seen some places across the region where they say, hey, we did affordable units. And you go, well, what level? And they're 80% of AMI. And listen, that's better than nothing, but it's not where the need exists most acutely, right? So when you set those local policies, you really want to be keen to, hey, all those wonderful people who work in the restaurants here along the main drag and ride deck, like, what do they actually make? Right? We, we value having them around. We like going out to eat. Have a, you know, so like, where can they live, right? Go ahead. When you, when, you build the, when you build the housing entity, you build it with tiered earning. Correct, mixed income 60, housing. 20, yep. So that everybody gets a piece of the action. Yep. Or if you take a place that's falling down and you want to retrofit it, then you do sweat equity and give everybody that. So you know, Cynthia, that's exactly what I was saying, is you want to set that policy up so, it's, so eventually you're encouraging mixed income housing, which is, yeah, you want to have some market rate units because it's hard to get the financing for the builder to build the thing if they don't have some income at a market rate. But then you want to require, literally require, some of the units at 80%, some of them at 60, some of them at 40, and you got to think long and hard about what those proportions should be based on the need in your community. But again, that's local. You have the local control to do that, and uh, it. It's uh, a good idea to use that, you know, use that local control. I was just going to say, I can't remember where I read it, but, you know, it's one of these really in-depth sort of Atlantic articles or yeah. something like that, maybe the New York Times, and they're just talking about the realities for developers. Oh, and it's the tough. it is to develop. So tough. You know, if you want, I mean, they're never, from the way it sounded in the article, you're never going to have this sort of, we are the world, everybody in this one place, you know, like, you're, it's going to require so much more of a high level units, let's say, something that costs a lot more. Yeah, so yesterday at our housing conference, we had this really great guy named Alan Malik, who's 81, I think he's 81 years old. He's a longtime urban scholar. And he made that exact point, which is yeah, it feels great to say someone's got to come build housing units that are affordable for people making 40% of the median income. But you better be prepared to really incentivize that because practically, you practically speaking, cannot build something and recoup your money with that level of rent because of a number of things. 
number one, talk about local control, is the review times for these projects are out of control, We're period. We're thinking about that right here yeah. in Rhinebeck. I'm sure you are. We can't even get the darn thing yeah. to be discussed. And can you imagine how and much it's money... it's going to be a good two years <laughs> of planning. Right. And can you imagine how much money it costs that developer oh. to go back to the architect again, back to the engineer again, back to this consultant again. And by the way, as that two years goes by, what happens? cost of plywood goes up and the cost of steel goes up and the cost of every input goes and up, right? And the incentive from New York State disappears. Right, or it disappears or it goes down or it gets passed along to another. It's so that's a, that's a piece of it. The other piece of it is we're finding it's harder and harder to actually find the labor in the region to go then build the darn thing. So that adds on another weight, right? <laughs> uh, the cost of materials we know because of some of the uh, global supply chain challenge. I mean, that's largely been overcome now, but we're still kind of feeling the effect, kind of feeling the effect of that. Interest rates are now up. So, you know, really, now we've gotten way off track here, but, but really, but that's you know. really yeah. happening oh, here. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And then the other thing, the other thing is this. There's a lot of people who will come out and shout against the oh, project that's they worth were here. And you know what? You know what the thing. You know what my favorite thing is that they'll say, "We can't have this project because we can't afford to have more kids in the we schools." We can't have our trees cut. Well, well, the more kids at the schools thing is the one that always makes me laugh because that's utter BS. It's nonsense. Okay, people who say that a have no clue what they're talking about, and b they advocate for the hollowing out of our communities because you know saying we can't have more kids in the schools means. All these trends I just told you about just get worse and worse if we listen to these people. So we need to uh, politely say you're wrong and you know move on. But uh, where, where where was I going with this? Oh yeah, that you know that opposition. But what there is not quite often is the same equal weighted voice of people who come out to speak in favor of it. Hey, listen, you know. We need people to work at the grocery store. We need people to work at restaurants. We need people to work in the local government offices, by the way, who get paid a salary that would go in that affordable housing unit. We need people to work at these places, and we need the housing. But we don't have that same passion and depth of people coming out to speak in favor of those projects as we do the people who say, hey, I was the last one to move here, and I shut the door behind me. Go scram. Thank you very much. Right? So that's, you know, that's something you got to do, get out in the community and encourage people to come out and speak in favor of this. We are yeah. in the process of the comprehensive plan, though, right? We have this whole, and I'm sure that's coming out and everything. There's a lot going on for Ryan. Yeah. At least that there's a lot of conversation around that. Comprehensive plan. That'll probably be their number one thing. Yeah. And I'm going to just iterate what Adam said. The comprehensive, I'm Gary Bassett, the mayor of the village of Ryan, but for those who don't yeah. know me. <laughs> Sorry I'm late, there's too many things going on. Um, the Comprehensive Plan Committee is meeting in front of the as we speak right now. Yeah. But as you said, it's great to get a group of people together and say, we need affordable housing, let's go do it, let's make it happen. Let's, yeah. do, let's do all of this right now. <clears throat> but as me as the mayor, I don't have the staff or the knowledge to put all of this together. I need help. I can't, it's not, it's one thing to say, go do it. It's another thing, how do we do it? And to do that, and that how, is a lot, is really, really hard, yeah. as you heard. Yes. And at a local government level, and we have the control at a local government, making that happen at the local government is really, really hard. We want it. You want it. We all want it, we all think it's a need, we all think it's a requirement, and we're gonna put our resources behind to do this, right? But I wanna let you know, it's hard. Even this community that we're trying to get locally here in Locust Grove, Locust Hill, which is now in, which is in the town, it's a hard thing to do. Our job is to make sure we supply utilities, services, and all that kind of stuff, but let's make it integrated. Let's make it part of our community. Let's not just say those over there. I don't want those over there. I want it to be part of our community. Yeah. I want it to be integrated so that it feels like part of the fabric of the village of Rhinebeck, right? You gotta work on that, you gotta work hard on doing that, and I'm 100% behind doing it, but I need help. I, I hope you'll come to those town meetings 
and say that. And I have been speaking that night, and I have been saying that loud and clear yeah. about what, what I think I want, right, and what I believe this community, community needs, yeah. right? But then you have the developer on the other hand who says, the supply chain is going up, the cost of utilities is going up, the cost of this is going up, and we say we need it to be at the 50% AMI. You know, we'll, we need the funding to be able to do that. At the local level, we don't have that funding. We got to, the, the state not, has it. They yeah. have it all together to and I'll just, move forward. It's not as easy as you it's think. got to get through. It's, it's, just, not as, it's not as easy as you think. So anyways, I'm going to get off my soapbox right now. It's got to be talked about yeah. in Rhineland yeah, at I'm gonna, the town yeah. hall. Yeah, I'm going to get off my soapbox <laughs> because I'm 100%, you know me, you know how I feel, you know what I want to get done, and you know how we got to focus on this, but let's really, really not just stand up and shout, you got to yeah. do it. Come and help me do it. And I'll, help me do it. And I'll amplify, I'll amplify one thing the mayor said, which is <clears throat> all this stuff is hard at the local level. Here's one benefit of being at the local level is um, you saw what happened with the governor's ideas last year. And then, you know, what we said about the governor's ideas is, is she had the uh, she had the symptoms right right she had the diagnosis right the prescription was mostly right but there were there were some flaws in the prescription we've talked with her staff at depth about this they looked to us for policy ideas which I'm very thankful for the one benefit you have is the governor when trying to she was doing communication at a macro level right trying to convince an entire state that they needed to care about housing for X Y and Z reasons. This is a very difficult issue to use cap to use macro level communications to be persuasive. Absolutely, home rule. It is much easier to be persuasive with micro level communications on this. In other words, it's much easier for you to invite me to a town and village board meeting, and I can go through with you all sorts of data, and you know even have the people who are really against housing in the room and let them yell at me and have some catharsis, and I'll tell them all the reasons they're wrong and half of them will change their mind because micro-level communications just work better than macro-level communications. So to the extent you have people who don't think that you need some housing that's affordable for people who work in blue-collar and service jobs in your community, um, there's a polite, evidence-based way to disavow at least some of them of that notion and turn them into proponents instead of opponents. Yeah. We have your 2015 report on part of yeah. the um, Affordable Housing Committee. Yeah. You worked with yeah, us, yeah. you gave us. It's all part of the yep. information for the town. To yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have taken that step. Yep. The people who are opposing it aren't going to read that. Sure. Just That's <laughs> I understand your frustration. Yeah. Well, question for you, Gary. And yep. Um, is um, the, are, when we speak affordable housing, are we also looking at affordable purchasing of homes? Because I'm seeing a lot of people that want to purchase and not continue to rent all the time. Yes. Yeah, so, so I know I, I can't speak about Rhinebeck and Red Hook specifically, but certainly in our work we do. Um, I'll give you an example that's far away from here. We're doing a project in the city of Mount Vernon right now down in Westchester County. And we've been talking about both. So one of the things we pointed out to them is the Habitat Humanity chapter that covers them is now doing co-op multifamily ownership models, which their median home price in Mount Vernon is $600,000 right now. The co-op ownership price is like 225 or something like that. So you gotta think of housing like a series of graduations. Right? You graduate from high school or college, you move out of home, you're living with a roommate at some point. Maybe you meet someone you like, you move in with a spouse, you have a slightly bigger apartment. And then usually that next step of graduation would be you buy some modestly sized home. And that right now is where the big gap is. I mean, there's this whole rental gap too, but that, that leap, the river has gotten too wide to leap from that rental into that first stage of home ownership because we have not really built that first level of home ownership in the, in the region anymore. So there's a lot of different models you can use to do it. There's smaller homes on smaller lots that relies on zoning and some other things that we won't get into. There's some things about rules related to manufactured homes that are changing in the state soon that should make it a little bit easier. There's 
multifamily limited equity ownership models where if you can get into one of these like co-ops or a, sort of they look like townhouses in some cases, that may allow you to build up some equity and savings to then jump into what we think of as more like traditional home ownership, even though you own that attached unit. So there's all sorts of things. The question comes down to how do we set up the codes, the regulations, the incentives, and all the other things we need to have someone come build the darn, the darn thing, right? So that's, that's really where the, um, the good ideas meet implementation. How do you operationalize these ideas, right? And that comes down to, it, as Gary pointed out, and as others point out, you know, this local control thing that's so important. We have some of, we have a lot of these strings in our hands. We just got to understand how to pull them in the right direction to get what we need and want. There's a wonderful yep. movie that was here, heard in the last couple of weeks, called Join or Die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About, about uh, um, Paul Putnam, who wrote the book Bowling, Bowling, Bowling Alone. Alone. I had yes. to read that in grad well, school. The, the movie is called Join or Die. Yeah. And it speaks about social capital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. C-A-P-A-T-A-L. -T -T yep. Yeah. And, and it says if we don't pay, start paying attention to doing that again, we're, we're not going to make it as a yeah. culture. Yeah. And I think that sure. that's probably true. No. Yeah, so she, um, I guess I'll say, not to wrap this up, but I think we should probably start wrapping this up. Um, but um, thank you all very much for being here uh, tonight. Um, our, our goal in this was, was to help identify areas where people in our community need, need help. And, and obviously there's the, there's the big challenging things, which were segregated a little bit from the, the, the not so simple things about food transportation and, and things like that. And, um, but there's, there's a myriad of challenges that people in our community have. And we wanted to try and make sure that for, for our own organizations and, and what we do, um, have, we have some clarity on where we can have impact and where other nonprofits can do it. And, and, and also to help feed the municipalities and so forth with the bigger things. Um, they can help us with the small things by supporting us, but also reinforcing what they know but maybe helping to prioritize the other needs that are, that are in our communities um, so that we as a community can start moving together with, with the data, with the, with the feedback, that we can help push back on some of those who are naysayers and, and not in my backyards, and, but also to, to maybe make some incremental changes um, forward to help, help who's here and, and, and make our communities the best that they can be for everyone who lives here. So that, that was really our intention in this, and, and, and I think we've got some good passion for it. Um, and the, the next step is how do we take all this wonderful, all these wonderful challenges and turn it into changes and improvements in our community, and, and that's the work ahead of us. So for, for all of us, and it's not, it's not just the community center or Reddit Response or, 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 or Gary or, or Elizabeth in the town, it, it's all of us to try and work together to your to your point, join or die. It's about the community pulling together as a as a as a uh, as a as a as a place. So, um, if yeah, you can I just say one thing, please. I want to thank you for doing this. Thank Adam for being presenting. Yeah. But because I it's Aaron, thank you. Because I I think this is a fundamental building block. And I look at these blocks, and you've got to start piling the blocks together, right? And once you start getting all the pieces, you can have a plan. This is part of the block. So what we're doing with the comprehensive plan is another block. What we're doing and what's happening at the state level is a block. You can start building these layers where you can actually then get something accomplished. But it takes this kind of work, so thank you. And, okay. and just so everyone here knows there's a lot of passion here, maybe people want to go home and read more about it. This is widely available, so we, 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 we will use it for our own strategic planning for our agencies, but it is also posted on um, the Red Community Center website. From now it's on, until I know forever. The, the town has it on uh, available through their website. I don't know about. The, I don't know if the village. Does not, yet. not yet. Not yet. There is so, a link in the press release. It's. it's, it's, it, it's if it's, if, it's, if it you would like to give me time. your email um, and and print it clearly, I would be glad to send you a copy of the presentation and or the, the study um, if you'd like it or if you have a, a card, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and it's going to be on Panda. And it's going to be on Panda. Thank you, Panda. Yes. The study itself is very interesting. It's more than 170 pages. Has all the information that backs this up. Don't worry, there's appendices. You, 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 there's lots of reading to be done. Read the main part. <laughs> so, so again, Adam, thank you yeah, so much for being out here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
we're not going anywhere either. I mean, like I said, you know, fortunately, I live right over the bridge. So uh, if there comes a time where you need someone to speak to a bigger set of folks about, you know, trends and needs in the region, uh, you may have to bake my wife some cookies to get me away from the house again, but I'll come. I promise. Great. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.